My name is uh, Dr. Kabira Damu. I'm the Managing Director of Beacon Consulting Limited. We're an enterprise security risk management and intelligence uh, provider, both here in Nigeria, as well as in the Sahel region. In psychological warfare, you take into account the psychology of your adversary. Now, when I had that statement, I did a little bit of analysis and the conclusion is that this is an adversary who is feeling on top of the world. That the adversary has been very successful in recent times, uh, starting from the Kadula train incident to the Kuji incident. Um, to an attempted, well, not attempted, actually, an attack on the convoy of Mr. President, if the National Security Advisor can use the word this, this um, emanated, then we know that, decimated rather, we know that um, the attack was not just a, a common attack. I'm quoting the National Security Advisor. So it's an, an adversary that is feeling on top of the world because of these successes and uh, in the psychology of warfare, that adversary would want to advance um, his or her front. And so what is the highest you know, front that they can um, attack? It's the office of the president, uh, as well as, of course, the state where they are domiciled, that's Kaduna state. Um, so clearly, they are feelings uh, at that level where they think right now they can do anything. And uh, I can conclude by saying that that is not a good situation for any um, you know, war or conflict situation where your enemy is feeling this um, excited with the successes he or she has achieved. So when I watched that documentary, I actually saw an opportunity um, and I'm a little bit shocked that the government is not seeing that, that opportunity. Uh, or contrary to the narratives that have flown around before about you know, the so-called conspiracy theories, the reasons why you know, the killings are happening, right now we're hearing from the spouse's mouth, as it were, through uh, you know, a daredevil journalist who has um, risked his life to reach to them there are reasons for what they are doing. Now, we've always known that one of the drivers of the conflict is the inability of the state to be there for victims. Now, at the beginning, there were victims, victims of cattle rustling, uh, victims of killings. I'll give you an example. I know a family that was taken to a piece of land somewhere in just south local government in Plateau State to buy that piece of land. And while they were taking around that piece of land, um, I'm sorry to say this, it's not a very good thing, but um, it will give you a sense of what I'm trying to say. The heads of three persons were seen spiked on what looked like a pool. Uh, they, they, they were killed and they were spiked there inside the farmland. Now, naturally, the persons who were taken to the land did not buy that land, but they went further to investigate what happened. So it appears that as far back as 19, late 60s, 70s, there used to be a Fulani settlement in that location. Now, those heads were the heads of the Ardu, the, the local head traditional ruler of that Fulani settlement in um, that part of Jos. Now, the reason why I brought this up for you, I was discussing the issue of um, the inability of the state to protect victims. Now, this particular instance, I'm not aware that any member of the, that family has been compensated for the killings that was done to them. I don't, we, I don't know the full story. I don't know what led to the killing, but it's apparent that it was an extrajudicial killing if the heads would be spiked on a farm. Now, the reason why I brought this up, and I'm answering your question, why do they want to embarrass government? Um, they probably feel, and this is based on uh, some of the findings we've done, they feel let down by the government. Uh, there are several um, instances, studies, as well as experiences that we've had where you encounter a Fulani settlement and all they want is a, just a school um, to be built for them, where their children will be able to attend 
the pri even if it's primary school or you know hospitals close to where they are so that they can attend to that so they feel not just marginalized they feel completely left out of the scheme of things so if we are talking inclusion that is one community that we should, we need to look at closely now not just um, excluded they also feel extorted there are instances and this is well documented where their cattle has been stolen they will go to the police instead of the police to help them to recover those cattle the police will, will start collecting money from them in the name of extortion in fact there is an infamous case somewhere in Kuji where you know it, it was a case of cattle rustling um they went to the police to report it and one of them was arrested and kept in custody because they didn't have any money to you know as it were uh, re respond to the extortion and that person was kept for months upon months in custody now that is the genesis of um the whole thing uh the some of them picked it up as in every conflict they became um you know uh agitated they got weapons uh, from most likely the sahel uh, trickling down from libya or the conflict in niger as well uh, and as well as even um, from mali and uh from this social agitation or grievances that are related to both social and political issues it, it has now become a crime uh, where uh, what we are seeing is a criminal gang uh, who are you know engaged in banditry who are engaged in kidnap for ransom and several other criminal activities um so that is why when they use the word embarrass they are referring to that initial uh you know as it were Uh, inability of government to protect them and to support them and then of course the extortion now the second element which is the this criminality that they are engaged in we can also stress it to the inability of the criminal justice system to respond to offenses in other words arrest offenders including them as well as others who are engaged in the offense and time will not allow me to go into the complexity of the issue but suffice to say that they want to embarrass the government because they feel let down by the government so first off um i'm taking that statement for what it is uh, a statement by a governor who yes uh, he's a member of the ruling party yes he's um, presumably close to the president uh yes he's influential within the scheme of things of the ruling party but he's not in any way part of the paraphernalia of um intelligence cycle around mr president there is a paraphernalia of intelligence um you know cycle around mr president starting from his chief of staff to the national security advisor to the various agencies in government um i can't even begin to count them because there are so many um there is a department within the presidency that all they do is clip newspapers and i'm hoping in today's world also look at the social media um and then make this available in summarized version to mr president uh some would even clip videos including interviews on um, television stage stations make a summary of them and make available to mr president so i'm well, all i'm trying to emphasize is there is a perennial paraphernalia of intelligence that is available to mr president and that on a constant basis would um, brief him on on developments um uh, his excellency governor arufai is not part of that paraphernalia now i'm also aware that most presidents have um influence uh you know it, um, platforms these are individuals of high standing in the society who they have contacted and i know this from the different regions and from the different uh, divides in in nigeria so there will be christians there will be muslims um there will be you know different shapes of, of persons that most presidents now i wouldn't know if this current president has but i know from experience that most other presidents do have and i would be very surprised if this current president doesn't have that also make available to mr president their views on current issues as they occur so the reason why i'm giving you this response is that if um his excellency governor rufai made that statement he may have he may have made that statement from the position of ignorance he is presuming that mr president's response to the fact that he's telling mr president that a threat 
has been made to him. And probably Mr. President made a joke out of it that, well, this, I'm just hearing it from you. But is he aware of this paraphernalia of intelligence around Mr. President? And I'm almost certain the moment that trade was made would have made available. The second part of my response is, well, it's some, it's, it's one part for the intelligence or news or information to be made available is another part for the individual in this instance, Mr. President, to read it and to um, take it into cognizance. He may have just felt this is not nothing for me to worry about. And so just threw, threw it away or did not take it seriously. Uh, but suffice to say, um, I'm taking that uh, opinion uh, by uh, Governor Rufai with a pinch of salt, especially since none of the agencies of government have come out to respond um, to it, uh, it's very likely that uh, that that's not exactly what happened. Um, yes, the the scenario as painted by Rufai happened, but um, it's very likely that Mr. President was aware of that threat. So it is a fact that uh, there are gunmen um, hibernating in ungoverned spaces, and I'm using this word loosely, ungoverned spaces. These are mountainous areas, forested parts around um, Abuja. Uh, anyone who knows the FCT knows that it is surrounded by mount mountainous hills. Um, there are roughly five to six states that are coterminous to the FCT. From each angle that you look at, uh, the six area councils of the FCT have one or the other uh, forested parts or mountainous um, part that leads into these coterminal states and that hibernate or harbor, um, you know, gunmen of different divides. These gunmen could be band so-called bandits. They could be criminal gangs that are engaged in abduction, or they could be, um, you know, terrorists. Now, this is it's not a new phenomenon. As far back as um, I think it was 2014 or, or 2013, when the Guzapi, uh, the South um, Special Anti-Robbery Squad detention center that was in Guzapi in Abuja was raided um, in the early mornings by one terror group, Ansaru, and it freed its members that were in detention. Um, that happened under the Good Luck Jonathan administration. And in my honest opinion, nothing much has been done to change this vulnerability. My job is to, co is to conduct risk assessment. Um, I'm an enterprise security risk management specialist. I conduct risk assessment and there are my, I'm trying to emphasize that there are vulnerabilities that exist within Abuja. And I've given you the example of this quote and unquote natural vulnerability that can be exploited. And in fact, that is being exploited by uh, these non-state actors and I've given you the types of non-state actors, terrorists, uh, you know, bandits and criminal gangs. They are exploiting it and they are using it to carry on offensive. Now, um, what what would should be the response of our security agencies? And I always say security should be deployed in four layers: the layer to detect, which can come in different forms. It should it could be human intelligence, which frankly is the cheapest and the most easily e easiest one available to us. How do we mobilize our residents, our citizens, into this human intelligence collection network? Uh, my my firm, become consultant, picked up the presence of these gunmen in Kujie uh, before the attack Kujie as an example. And we made it available. Um, if the government security departments uh, were doing their work, I'm sure they would have picked it up. I don't have that knowledge. The day didn't they? I don't know. But my point is that as part of that first layer of security, we should be able to detect any adversary that is approaching the FCT, whether by land or by these ungoverned spaces, these mountainous or forest areas, or even by air. So that is the first layer. The second layer is the um, layer of deny. Um, in other words, if, if once we detect that adversary, how do we deny that ad adversary from gaining access to the FCT? So it could be by just arresting that adversary, or it could be by just shooting him if he's armed and he's, or he's a suicide bomber that is coming to, or different ramifications, arrest, go and interrogate, and da 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 da. And then the third layer, is the layer of delay. So where we're not able to arrest that, uh, that adversary, how do we delay his entrance into the SVT? And then the last one is response. Um, you are a journalist, and I'm urging you, buy, or if, if you have, pick a common protractor, the one that you find in your mathematical set, and do what we did when we're in secondary school. 
of even primary school and draw a cycle round Kuji. And you'll be shocked at the number of security departments that would fall into that cycle. I, I, in fact, if I start counting them, their time will run out for us. So what happened that they didn't respond to that attack in good time? It means the infrastructure that we have for response is not effective. It could be because there is no infrastructure. It could be because it was never tested in terms of um, simulations and other trials to test its efficacy, or it could be as a result of negligence. So if I'm doing um, or I'm responding to your question, these are the four things I'm looking at. I'm not just looking at it like a layman will look at it. What components do we have for each and every one of these four layers of security? And I can tell you with all confidence that almost the entire 36 states of the Federation, their capitals, including Abuja, lack this um, components in a strategic and systematic manner. So in 21st century security, these are the kind of things we should be thinking about. How do we deploy se security for our urban centers and for our villages in this manner? Not deploying security to specific areas or buying vehicles or even buying gadgets. They are important, but how do they subsume into these four layers that I mentioned so that you can give any location, any city, the kind of protection it deserves. Um, so in direct answer to your question, Abuja is, um, the city is vulnerable. It is um, okay for people to be worried, but let, let's not just stop at being worried. What can we do to help ourselves? And I'm hoping that before we conclude, you give me a chance to mention a few things we can do to help ourselves. So let's go back um, in 2013 and uh, into 2014, one of the non-state actors that is operational in Nigeria now, the one we all call Boko Haram, which now has three factions, uh, gained notoriety worldwide as the world's deadliest terrorist group. That was the year that 13,000 um, Nigerians were killed. And uh, at, in 2015, we held elections. Yes, it can be argued that uh, the uh, issue, the challenge then was geolocated in the northeast of the country and that the then president did, uh, you know, contract, um, you know, private military contractors or mercenaries, and that they were able to tame the, ch the challenge. That can be argued, but the reality is that the security threat was extremely high, yet elections were held. Now, I am of the view that, yes, these issues are a threat to the elections, and if we don't manage them, they are likely going to be a threat to the election. But I don't see them as preventing the holding of the election. Rather, what I see them doing is casting a, a, a challenge, a doubt on the integrity of the elections. Um, as an example, the more IDPs you have, the more the likelihood of the manipulation of the outcome of the elections, the less likely people are able to come out to vote, the more likely um, that a president would emerge that is not the choice of the people, especially if the violence is strategic in locations where uh, certain elements are not allowed to come out to, to, to participate in, in, in elections. So those are the kind of things that worry me uh, in terms of the capacity of the Nigerian state to tame these things and allow elections to hold. I'm not in doubt. Even today, uh, well, let me be specific with the date, um, August 4th, um, 2022, the Inspector General of Police, who is the co-chairman of the Interagency Consultative Committee on Electrician Security, did hold, um, a, well, I call it a conference, a training session at the International Conference Center in Abuja. The INEC chair was there. It's on election management by the security agencies, and they are riding on their, the successes. Uh, virtually everybody has acclaimed that Oshun and Ekiti elections were successes. So lessons learned by the security agencies. Uh, the fact that we have a new electoral act, which also affects the, the code of conduct of um, security officers within the elect electoral process. Um, there is a need to conduct trainings. Let's not forget that there are civil society organizations the National Peace Committee that has played pre instrumental role. We also have foreign partners who have played that role. So to that extent, again, I, I think we've got the capacity to tame this, but whether it would be used willingly as a weapon 
to affect the integrity of the elections by either the you know, government in power or the opposition is something that unfortunately uh, the possibility and the potential is very, very high. In my honest opinion, the security situation that we have, um, each and every one of us, especially the government, has uh, a semblance of responsibility. Uh, the parliament too has a semblance of responsibility, just like the ex executive arm has some responsibility for the situation, just like some of us. If you are a family member and you've not taken time to incul incul inculcate in your child the right values that would uh, you know, make him not amenable to recruitment by some of these non-state actors, or that would not, that would even allow him to become an active uh, participant in the issues of security challenges in the country, then you are, you, are, you are making a contribution. And we have several families that unfortunately are in that category. If you are a religious cleric that actively promote hate and ethnic divide, you are contributing to it. If you are a school that allows all some of the misconducts um, within the school premises or even raise your whole boys, quote unquote, actively, um, then you are also contributing to it. So this blame, honestly, can be apportioned across the board. But yes, Mr. President, who is the CNC, uh, would probably take the largest share of the blame. And so to that extent, I think the impeachment threat, if it were like genuine, I personally don't believe it's a genuine threat. It's a political move uh, done mainly to achieve a political score. Uh, should be worried about the impeachment threat. But even before the impeachment threat, um, I have enough reason to believe that Mr. President took the matter of security seriously. Um, in, in the recent history of Nigeria, I cannot remember under any administration, including this one, when the National Security Council met three times in a month. Uh, it happened in the month of July. The National Security Council met thrice, and um, I'm aware that several issues of um, critical importance were discussed, and um, we're hoping that it's, the outcome of those issues will lead to in, an improvement in our security situation. However, there are gaps that I'm hoping would have to be blocked, and it has to do with the management of our security um, you know, sector. The coordinating elements within, within the security sector will need to uh, you know, improve on what they're doing at the moment. How do they hold to account members of the, especially the operational elements within the security sector. Uh, if, for instance, the Inspector General of Police, who has lead responsibility for managing crime, especially internal crime, uh, internal security issues, and we're seeing a deterioration using clear matrix, metrics, then he needs to be held accountable. He has come, he has submitted his budgetary requirement, we've given him what he wants, yet these things are increasing or the military, given the responsibility that we've given them, and we're seeing failure. So we, they need to improve on that ability to monitor and evaluate the performances of these um, agencies. And not only that, to hold them to account where there are failures, and in a very transparent manner, so that it is shown to Nigerians that these are the successes, these are the failures, and this is why so so person is either removed or in certain instances, even tried if there is evidence that there was negligence on this part that led to the death of the destruction of Nigerian property. That is the only way we can move forward. And to the night to the legislature, they need to contribute better in the three major areas that they contribute to national security. Number one is legislation. We have laws within our security sector that date back to colonial times. We have laws that date back to the military era that are not in, in, in consonance with our democratic aspirations. So they need to look at those laws and review them and improve them. The second area is in the area of the oversight. Most of these challenges that we're having, if the legislature was handling oversight properly, believe me, most of these issues would have been corrected at the level of oversight, not the kind of oversight that sometimes happens. And to do that effectively, our legislators have to improve their capacity and understanding of the security sector. Where they don't have that capacity and understanding, they need to engage aids that have expertise. So I, I, I cannot 
understand why the chairman of a particular committee on, on security does not have an aid that is an expert in that field. Uh, you are a journalist. I will urge you to go and make inquiries about that. You'll be shocked at what you find. And then the last one is in the budgetary provisions. Um, the, the needs and requirements of this security organization should be met. And do, in, in, in meeting those needs, we have to be very careful in how we meet those needs. The capital expenditure and recurrent ex expenditure, uh, I cannot envisage and understand a situation where in, the, in a war situation, we are opening a school of war, whatever, in a part of Borno State, when our soldiers are moving in light skin vehicles. So who passed that budget? What were the priorities in passing that budget? Was it a political consideration? Because I mean, I, I can't understand how we are faced with different conflicts in different parts of the country and our soldiers are still driving in light skin vehicles, yet we're engaging in this type of spending in military capital expenditures that frankly, um, are not necessarily related to the, the efficacy and the capabilities of our military. There are direct changes that would improve our capacity, the capacity of the military force multi multipliers. Um, I just give you the example of one, uh, increasing um, the, the protection uh, measures around our military, such as the vehicles they're using to move from point A to point B, moving in soft skin vehicles. It's, it's, it's a joke in 2022 or using GSM to communicate. Um, it's, yet we, we speak about 40, 50 column minutes within our security agencies. They may not have 50, 50 column minutes. All you do, get a young person who is tech, tech savvy and give him some money. And you'll be shocked at how he'll be able to intercept GSM phone calls. Who knows if that's what our, the terrorists are doing? So again, um, we all have a responsibility. I just finished speaking about the um, legislature. I, earlier on, I spoke about our rules as family members, our schools, and all that. What of the judiciary in the failure of, to prosecute um, suspects associated with terrorism? It's almost um, difficult, really, to pinpoint one or two persons that have been convicted for terrorism. I know there are a lot of issues, but it has to do with the ju judiciary, whether in the gathering of evidence, in the prosecutorial aspect, or even the the you know integrity as it were of some of the judges that we have in the country. So all of these issues have played a hand, unfortunately, in the situation. And whether it is the responsibility of the president alone, yes, again, he wears the cap. So he has probably the most uh, portion of this blame. But again, like I've pointed out, a lot of others to have um, you know their own portion of the blame. I'll divide them into, into um, short-term, long-term, and mid-term and long-term measures. Uh, some of them are policy issues, while others are operational issues. Now, the first thing I will recommend is an enhancement of the coordination between the federal and state government. Um, I'm not too comfortable with the current effort level of coordination and cooperation between the federal and state government. We are challenged uh, you know, by different threat factors in different regions. In fact, you can say Nigeria is at war from different fronts in the Northeast, uh, Niger Delta, Northwest, North Central, different fronts. And we have a military that is divided in all of these fronts. The best way to handle that is to enhance cooperation between the federal and state government. And the federal government would need to come up with a framework for addressing some of these issues. I think it has a framework for addressing terrorism. There's a national counterterrorism strategy. So if it's being used, and I emphasize the word if, because I think by now we should review that NACTES, national counterterrorism strategy. Now we also need a framework for handling banditry. Zamfara state cannot be handling banditry in the way it fits. Uh, Kathina in, it, in its own way. Sokoto, Kebi, uh, Niger, Kaduna. When it's one and the same thing, when these are the same bandits that are moving around, from the Sahel, Niger, sometimes through Kasena or through Zamfara, down to the other locations. And in forest, that uh, is more or less one forest that leads all, all the way to Abuja. So why don't you come up with a framework to address that issue? And it's been high time. This issue has been going on for more than a decade. By now, we need a, we need a framework. Now, embedded in that, in this need for cooperation and coordination between the two governments, is the need to take over these ungoverned spaces 
that we started this conversation by discussing ungoverned spaces. We are coming back to it. Most of these ungoverned spaces belong to the state government. Um, how will this enhanced coordination or cooperation between the federal and state government lead to a better way of managing this economic resource that we've allowed um, non-state actors to occupy and turn into places where they hibernate and create the kind of carnage that they are currently creating? Can you envisage a situation where if they abduct a hundred people and there is no ungoverned spaces, so no forest, no mountains for them to go and hide. Can you think of a place where they can go and keep them in urban centers or in our communities that people will not detect? I, I cannot think so. Because feeding a hundred persons, keeping a hundred persons quiet within build up areas, honestly, it's almost impos impossible. So they, it's easy for them because they, they have access to these ungoverned spaces. So in, embedded in that cooperation, we need to find a way. The Kano model is an example. Kano donated part of that forest, Falgore Forest, to the military. And the military had, has turned it into, quote and unquote, a, a training camp for his recruits. Now, it would be very difficult for any terrorist or bandit to go and you know, hibernate in a forest where he knows the military is like, dominated. Yes, it's possible they can ambush and rate such places, but for them to go and stay there and keep our, our brothers and sisters know it is very difficult. So that's number one. Number two, their mobility. We need to end this ability that they have to be mobile. Uh, they use motorbikes, uh, they move easily, they are able to communicate, and we know that how they are able to communicate. So we need to bring that to an end and do it in a legal manner without affecting citizens who are law-abiding. I'm not subscribing to a blanket um, you know, ban on motorcycles. I think it's wrong. Rather, we should use technology, register all um, you know, legal owners of um, motorcycles, and then use also technology. In fact, you can get 20 youths and task them. In today's Nigeria, the educated youths that are good in IT, task them to come up with a dashboard and an app that you can use in every time somebody pays 20,000 naira or even less to register a motorcycle, have embedded in that the, ca the capacity for you to monitor where that person on a dashboard and then maintain that, that dashboard. So that anytime you see a movement of 20 motorcycles um, that are not under this system, you know that these are bandits. And then you deploy, deploy a single jet for as an example, or very soon we're gonna have helicopter uh, gunboats. So uh, deploy it, let them go and drop a bomb. Over them. So it's not rocket science, it's doable, but we need to be smart about it and strategic. Then we also need to um, in, enhance our intelligence collection capabilities. I mentioned this earlier on. Uh, their intelligence is not just uh, raw information. Intelligence is gathered, it's harvested. We need to concentrate on the combination of human and um, technical intelligence. Both the physical world where you and I stay and within the cyberspace, there is too much intelligence in fact, and it needs to be harvested. I just give you the example, when you keep a hundred persons, there are things you are going to be buying for those hundred persons and you don't manufacture those things. If you have your ears and eyes in the, on the ground, you would very soon, two days after, you'll be able to pick a picture of who is coming to buy what in what number. Does the person have a shop? Where is he taking it to? And that's how you, you, you develop your intelligence. Put it in one small place, bring another information, and before you know it, the picture emerges already, and a network of who is involved emerges, and then you use tactical force to go after them. And that brings me to the next point, the capability and capacity of our security agencies. It's a long-term thing, but we need to start enhancing, especially tactical um, abilities within our security agencies. Almost all of them have tactical units. But why are they not being used at the moment? That question needs to be answered. They, they should have the, the capacity to do precision tile um, you know, operations where they go into the forest, take out the leadership of these groups and free those persons with minimal casualty. I know there's going to be some level of casualty, but by the time we do that once, twice, believe me, they will stop kidnapping our people because they too want, want to leave. They love themselves. And of course, so that's at the level of government. At the level of community, earlier on, I, I spoke about our value systems and how our inability to um, you know, and hold on to those good values that we know is leading to where we are. And we all have a role to play from the media that, you know, unfortunately, some media houses allowed this ethnic profiling that has created the monster that we, we know today from the religious institutions that promote hate sometimes to our family members who unfortunately don't play their role. 
um, name them. We all have a role to play to help in this. So that's, I think, in the, on the hand, uh, area of um, you know, those in power. For us citizens, beyond what we're expecting government to do, we also need to start protecting ourselves. Earlier on, I spoke about the four layers of security. Uh, the layer to detect, to put that around, around ourselves. Now, the question is how? It's very easy. Even your house, your house should have those layers. Why do you put doors in your house? Why do you put windows? Why do you those rules? The burglar bars are delaying the adversary. Eventually, the adversary has a hammer. You would break it. And that is where the response um, layer also comes in. You should be able to have the telephone number of the security agency nearest to you and also develop a relationship with them. Buy pure water, buy water packs, go and give them and make yourself amenable to them. From time to time, go there, say hello to the DPO. The day you call him that you are in distress, he knows you, he will come. So let's 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 develop our security along this layer. Then lastly, there is an app that is on the um, iOS as well as the, play, the Android Play uh, store. Um, it's called Citizen 8. It's an app that teaches you what to do if you are under any type of security challenge, whether terrorism or name them. The app tells you what to do. Um, so download it. It's free. And, uh, you know, just take your time, read through it, and then sit down with your family and your other loved ones and do a drill based off on what you've learned. Do a drill, um, you know, using the example of a bomb or the example of an active uh, shooter. And then if the mistake you make during those drills, correct it. Got the day, you know, any of you encounters the real situation, you would know what to do already. So that is why it's important beyond what the government is doing, and whether they do it or not, let's also do our good. I'm not advocating for anyone to go and get armed. Uh, as someone who has carried <laughs> weapons in the past, I know it's not, uh, you know, it, it will not really do you any good in certain instances, but learn all of these things to protect yourself and reduce the risk around you. It's a better approach than for you to go and carry a, a weapon, especially in these days when we are, we, we are not allowed to carry um, combatant weapons like AK-47 or AK-49 and the enemy coming to attack you already has this combatant weapon. So your best bet is to use your head, your, your smartness, and to escape these attacks. And like I said, download that app. It has a lot of tips around it. And then for corporate organizations and families who can afford it, there are experts, including consultancies like my own, that can come in and support your understanding of security and your deployment of security along these four layers that are mentioned. It's not rocket science, but you have to know it. And knowing it and integrating it in a systematic and strategic manner will help reduce your exposure to security risk.